family-owned shop in Loganville, Sosby's Garage, for all your automotive repair needs. We service all makes and models, Ford and domestic. We repair engines, alternators, brakes, alignments, AC systems, and more, using certified technicians with over 90 years of combined experience. We also offer same-day service for some repairs. Sosby's Garage, 200 Bay Creek Road in Loganville. Dependable, honest, and fair. Look us up on Google or Facebook. We'll take good care of you. Broadcasting live from the Subaru of Gwinnett studio inside the Sonesta Gwinnett Place Atlanta Hotel. It's time for Case in Point, presented by Paradigm Security Services. We are the cornerstone of security in the Southeast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Case in Point, presented by Paradigm Security Services. I'm your host, Rick Strawn, president of Paradigm Security Services. We're excited to be with you again today on Business Radio X. We're broadcasting live from the Subaru of Gwinnett Studio, located in the beautiful Sinesta Gwinnett Place Atlanta Hotel in Duluth, Georgia. In addition to Paradigm Security show, uh, Services, this show is also brought to you by Sosby's Garage and the Mana, Skip, Mana Scholarship Fund, who does the week's Opposite Mind. Be sure and tune in and listen to Dr. Jeannie Burnett. She's got some great shows. On every show... We feature businesses and organizations and people in the Atlanta area, especially those that serve Gwinnett County. While all businesses have security concerns, not all are about physical security. And we will touch base on that and other related aspects of security through the course of our shows. Our guest today, I'm extremely glad to have Mr. Sean Still. Uh, if you all don't know him, you probably don't have a swimming pool. Uh, if you do know, if you got a swimming pool, you probably know him. But uh, he's also running for as a candidate for the state senate district forty-eight. And Sean, glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a, an awesome year. Uh, we're just kind of waiting to see how things play out because it's going to be uh, very challenging for everybody over the course of this. Let me ask you first, before we start into this, uh, I'll, for those that don't know you, who is Sean Still? Sean Still is an entrepreneur. He is a father of three beautiful daughters, ages 10, 14, and 16. And uh, he's, a, he's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he has businesses in Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Ecuador. Uh, no, but... We, if we had an hour to talk, we'd be talking a lot about your Ecuador thing in North Carolina. But, you know, having kids in today's world, you know, you're going to be very familiar with all the issues that are going on with school systems and all of that. But before we get into that, let's talk about the district itself. Uh, with all the changes in districts around the state, uh, could you describe the geography of this particular district that you're running for in 48? So District 48 is a new slash old district. Um, previously, for the last 20-plus uh, years, District 48 has been one-third Johns Creek, two-thirds Duluth. Because of population shifts um, in Gwinnett and Forsyth, as counties grow, um, Senate districts have to shrink to accommodate that population. So each Senate district across the state of Georgia represents 191,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, with the massive growth in Gwinnett and Forsyth, they had to shrink those districts. They had to pull back uh, their geography, their, their map footprint. And so all of South Forsyth um, got pulled out of the, the current district that's represented by uh, Senator Dolezal. Um, Senator Clint Dixon uh, represents a large portion of Gwinnett County, but he had to lose population as well, which covers um, everything east, um, excuse me, west of Peachtree Industrial Boulevard. So Swanee, Sugar Hill, and Buford going from uh, essentially uh, just north of uh, Sugarloaf all the way up to the lake and everything in that, that sliver of um, everything west of Peachtree Industrial. All of South Forsyth that touches Johns Creek and to the to the south and Gwinnett to the east. So if you could kind of visualize it, it looks kind of like a squirrel wearing a cape. I've heard that described <laughs> to, to to kind of cover it. But it's but it's Johns Creek, South Forsyth, and then half of Swanee, Sugar Hill, and Buford. 
pretty good sized district. It is, and it represents 191,000 people. 191,000. You know, when you have all that, you have a lot of businesses and stuff. You know, what do you actually do for a living as far as, you know, it's in, in Gwinnett County and areas like that? So my swimming pool construction company, we, we install a product called Pebble Tech. And so uh, anyone who owns a, a, a backyard residential pool or a, they, they have a, a home in their, a pool in their neighborhood, um, chances are um, there's about a 75% chance that it has Pebble Tech in it. And so we're the exclusive dealer of that type of finish. And it's millions of tiny colored pebbles mixed in a, uh, in a colored cement paste, and we trowel that on for the interior finish. It, it looks better. It looks more natural, more lagoon-like. And, uh, and we do well over 1,000 pools a year um, in the metro area uh, with that finish. So that's my real day job. That's what kind of pays the bills. We do that. And then we also do a product called Shotcrete, which is Shotcrete is pneumatically placed concrete. So when you see a big barrel truck of concrete, mm-hmm. um, we blast it into the, the hole to create the swimming pool shell and so we do that as well so we're uh, the largest uh, plastering company on the east coast Uh, we're the largest uh, subcontractor of any kind for the swimming pool industry in the the southeast well you know that in and of itself sounds pretty much like a full-time job so when you're doing as much as you're doing there and with as much time as got to be involved there you know, how do you own three businesses in two states and down in Ecuador? I have an amazing team. Um, I have really taken a great deal of pride in training great people, great managers uh, to, to handle the day-to-day that give me the freedom to be able to check in, uh, to be able to uh, dip in and out of, of those different businesses. So whether it's the, the whitewater rafting company in North Carolina, if it's bird watching tours in Ecuador, um, through great cell phone coverage, through uh, different you know methods of communication, uh, I can check the books. I can check staffing. I can can deal with personnel issues literally from anywhere in the world. That's that's awesome. It sounds like you've got an awfully full life. So you know why would you want to tackle something like this on top of all that? I had to. I had to with with three girls um, with over a hundred Guanetians, uh who rely on me for payroll every week, um, running a multi-million dollar business that's two generations deep. I was really in a, a situation where I had to do something. I've been behind the scenes in politics for the last 10 years, and I've seen a lot of mistakes be made. I've seen a lot of people fall short of what they promised to do. As you said, I have a very full life. I have an amazing uh, family, and I, I love what I do. But if somebody like me doesn't step up and say, I'm not doing this because I need it, I'm doing it because I think that my state and my district need me, it's it's not ego at that point. It's really enough just... Enough is enough. Enough is enough. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the fraud. I'm tired of the lies. I know how to do something about it because I've been in the room when a lot of things have happened, but I have stopped short of running stepping until now. That limb. <laughs> and now. And now I'm stepping out. Well, you know, there's so much going on right now in the, in the world. You know, you've got three kids. Uh, they're in school. I've got grandkids in school now. Luckily, my kids are no longer in school. But I've got grandkids that I'm concerned about. And you've got a lot of issues going on with the school systems right now. Can you give an idea of what you think about uh, – the different CRT style programs. I won't think a lot of people say, well, it's not called that. Well, true, it may not be, but it's that style of indoctrination, if you will. But that and um, the masking and all the issues we're talking about, especially with Gwinnett County right now, since we're here, that's what I'm most familiar with. And and I would assume that that's where most of your interests are too. So kind of give us your outlay on some of that stuff and your thoughts. So two real examples about that. Um, one is uh, the director of transportation um, over the school board in Forsyth County. And this is bleeding over into Gwinnett. So I know that Gwinnett is, is studying the same thing. In August, uh, before kids went back to school, just this past fall, the director of transportation sent out a memo to all school bus drivers saying they are no longer to refer to the children on the bus as boys and girls. So they were to be referred to as they or them. 
taking away the identity of what a five-year-old would be because they didn't want them to be confused or to feel judged over what they are. So this entire woke mentality that's trickling down to literally five-year-olds um, is is absolutely disgusting. Um, it, it just makes the, the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I want to do everything I can to fight that. Regarding CRT, the more that we keep teaching racism, the more that we keep talking about the color of our skin, the longer it's going to be before we move beyond it. And they're actually promoting it now. Absolutely. So um, Senator Clint Dixon has introduced a bill that is going to um, stop all CRT education in all public schools across the state. I am with him 100% in, uh, in stopping that. And right now, Clint is the only Republican senator representing over a million people in Gwinnett County, and his district only covers 191,000 people in Gwinnett. It's amazing. So the rest of that is, is, is not being fairly represented. So Gwinnett desperately needs another strong Republican who knows the district, who has a business in the district, who has fought for this district for decades. And right now, I'm, I'm the only guy that, that can, can speak to that. Well, Clint's coming on here this next month, so we'll be de- we'll be definitely talking about a lot of that. Well, you've got the, you've got the educational part. You've got a lot of problems on the the border. A lot of people think that the border does you know that's down in Texas, Arizona, California, New Mexico. That's where the border. Is. Well, there's a lot in that border that's affecting all, really every other state. They say that every state now has become a border state. And I tend to agree with them. I lived in Albuquerque for a lot of my childhood growing up, born in West Texas. So I'm very familiar with that border down there. And I've been out many times, not during this crisis, but I know the lay of the land and and how it works. Kind of give us your thoughts on that, uh, because I know that a lot of the people that you work are from Mexico. Uh, they're legal immigrants on work visas, absolutely, which I have no problem with, and I'm all for. So, kind of give me your out, you know, your look on that. I think the concept of a wall has been um, exaggerated and and misconstrued in a lot of ways. It's it's not the Great Wall of China, and a wall, a physical wall, does not stop people from migrating. Mm-hmm. I think that if the Border Patrol cannot handle what we have, and clearly they're overrun and they're understaffed and there's no way they can do it. They're not given the tools they need to do this. But if we have, if we can at least create bottlenecks to be able to check and control um, access points, and if we can create work visas or some other method of of what it's gonna be, then it it will encourage legal activity. Um, The H2B uh, sponsorship program, we had to stop doing it because we never knew from year to year who we were going to be able to get. Mm-hmm. So depending on your grouping, you know, if one year you're group A, great, then you get the 10, 15, 20 guys that you applied for. And the next year you're in group F and then you get nobody. And how do you staff for that? And then you can't, as, as a business owner, you can't operate without knowing who your staff's going to be in a very seasonal business. So the construction industry, agriculture, they're all seasonal. But if you don't know from one year to the next who you can rely on, you can't do it. So the, the federal government has failed us with immigration sponsorship programs when, for people that have tried to do it legally. Um, you know, we tried to put a wall up that never got completed that it can easily be, you know, bypassed. And I've, I've seen plenty of video oh, where it is being yeah. bypassed. So unless we can get the tools to our border patrol, unless we can can help Mexico get out of the problem that they're in to make people not feel like they have to flee for their lives, um, that's a real problem. I, I learned just a few weeks ago that Mexico is not testing uh, for COVID. They're not quarantined. They're not doing anything. It's it's literally it's 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 wide open. So. Uh, people can come and go. Um, any disease, any sort of you know viral warfare that somebody wants to conduct, it is open access to be able to get to us. So Absolutely. it's not just illegal immigrants coming through. It is open access for literally anything that somebody wants to cross the border if they're willing to drive down past an opening in a wall that that could never be finished, 
uh, physically, um, I- at least in some areas, and um, and we're we're failing uh, miserably in terms of our current domestic policy to crank down on that. And uh, the Biden administration has has failed um, in a way that I never really thought was possible in such a short period of time over what President Trump had had started. Well, what is it we need to do here in Georgia to do to directly deal with this or indirectly deal with it either way? So in Georgia, the the situation varies by county. Uh, it also varies by city, um, you know, in terms of what's enforced, what's not enforced. Are, are drugs enforced? Are we prosecuting for uh, for theft? Are we prosecuting for drug possession? Are we, you know, prosecuting for, for anything else? Are we checking for someone's immigration status when they're arrested? Um, it, every city and every county has their own freedom to decide how that's going to be enforced. So Georgia has an issue with this regarding just the entire perception. We do not have enough support um, at the state level for our county and local police to do what they need to do. Um, our, our local police are unable to do all the things they need to do because of political agendas by people who are above them. And oh, so absolutely. the officer um, on patrol uh, is is limited from one administration to the next on how he can actually do his job and stay personally safe and protect the people that he's he's paid to, to protect. Um, I am going to be one of the strongest advocates for stopping any of this defund the police crap that has been talked about um, in, in a lot of metro areas. Um, I was attacked by BLM protesters in Washington, D.C. A, a year and a half ago uh, just because of the clothes I was wearing, and the D.C. police couldn't do anything to protect us. They told us that we had to just um, get, out of the way. get out of the way and yeah. hope for the best. That, that just, that's just so crazy. Uh, and coming from a law enforcement background, I know exactly what these officers are dealing with. You know, they're, they're limited by the politicians to even being able to address the illegal uh, immigrant issue. Uh, we used to do a lot more in Gwinnett County and with the new administration that's come in, including the sheriff. Uh, a lot of that has been restricted, and there's not a lot people can do about it. So it's, you know, it's just everybody open. It's open borders in Georgia as well. It is. The... Um, can you see any any hope for that in the long run? Long what? run, yes. Um, but I think it starts at the top. Um, not to make this overly political, but no, um, but the fight that's happening at at the top of the ticket uh, for this coming November is we see uh, two lifelong Republicans, well respected, uh, both with faults, uh, both with. Uh, great things that they've done, amazing resumes. And the fight and the, the bloodbath that those two are wreaking upon each other is fracturing the Republican Party. And so for someone who's a down-ballot candidate like myself, I have to look to them to say, who's going to be the best person to help us with the policies that, that we're going to you know, hopefully enact? If we fail in that endeavor of getting a Republican elected. Then you may have a state legislature that's Republican, and then you're going to have a Stacey Abrams as your governor. That would be terrible. And what would that do? So we have to look at any laws that, that or bills that we pass in the House or Senate, we'll and then we, and we send that to the governor's desk, everything will be vetoed. So if, if we're not all rowing in, in the same direction, if, if the Republican Party, if the business community is not all rowing in the same direction and looking at pro-business policies, and, and a pro-business policy is lower taxes, it's pro-immigration in the sense of control, it's, it's anti-defund the police to make sure that, that Georgia is a great place to live and raise a family and have a business. Um, Georgia is growing. We're growing like crazy. We like to tout that we're the number one state in the country in which to do business, but uh, but we've got a long way to go to, to fix all the things. We've got to improve on education. We've got to improve on health care. As you pointed out, immigration is terrifying about what's happening. And so by having open access, by having our southern border um, you know, coming up through Florida and, and all the, the things that are coming in through our ports, uh, coming in through our airport, if we don't have a way to lock that down, if our police are not empowered to be able to do their jobs correctly, then as private citizens, as business owners, as parents of children, grandchildren, it's, uh, it's going to be an uphill battle. 
You know, one of the things I've been most concerned about is having people in, in the party with the Republican Party that would end up spending all of their time tearing each other down to try to make sure that they're the ones that end up at the top that in the end it gives so much ammunition, true or not, to give so much ammunition to the opposition that they're unwinnable. Uh, and that's been my biggest concern out of the way that we're headed right now. That's exactly where we're heading. So, And I hope that people kind of listen, the ones that are running listen to some of the people out here and just say, you know, talk positive, quit talking negative, don't be cutting each other down because we cannot, we cannot last forever like it is if we don't. We can't. And so, you know, we have a primary at the end of May. Mm-hmm. From now until November, Stacey Abrams has a clear shot to do nothing oh, yeah. but, but just – win a popularity contest. Meanwhile, we have Kemp and Purdue. We have four people in a, in a U.S. Senate race that are all, all vying for a position. And then somehow we're going to have to glue all this back together in June to then start uniting the parties. And then we only have from June until November to do it. So and that is not long in the political world. Four months is going to be a blink of an eye. Absolutely. Well, I know that um, when you have the immigration problems that you have, Along with that brings things like uh, human trafficking, uh, drug trafficking. And Atlanta has been proven to be, well, when I worked uh, with the DEA in a, on a task force back in the 80s, uh, I can tell you the uh, drug trafficking was, Atlanta was a hub. And today it's a greater hub. So because of all the, the expressways, the trafficking, the, I mean, all the main thoroughfares come through Atlanta. It's a perfect place for the hub on the wheel. Um, along with that, is with the trafficking coming across the border, a lot of that drugs is just we've seen a tremendous increase in uh, a lot of the illegal drugs. But one of the biggest problems we've had uh, coming into Georgia is a twofold issue of the human trafficking and uh the gangs uh so we've got to work see about working on that through our politicians we do and we need to make sure that we're not inviting industries or businesses to georgia that are known for those things um i know that there was a lot of talk about bringing casinos to atlanta um and and what that would do and and People talk about the job creation and, and the, the tax basis, but casinos are known to be the number one driver of drug distribution and human trafficking Absolutely. and prostitution. So if we want to make Georgia a great place and a safe place, casinos are the opposite way of doing that. No, I, I totally agree. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to do it, but they're thinking about money. They're not thinking about morals, uh, and that has a, a, a big effect. Um you have a lot of employees in Georgia. We'll kind of switch the track here. Uh, how, how many do you foresee in the future? How many have you got now? Currently, I have 110 on the payroll. I believe that we'll be at 120 to 125 as we uh, crank out the uh, Q1 of 22. So um, the amount of contracts that I have of jobs to start is – um, rolling into January is half of the total work that I did in all of 21. Wow. And for a 30 year old company, uh, that was started by my, my cousin, um, out of his house in Dunwoody. And, uh, we've grown to the, the company that we are today. It's, it, it's daunting. It's, it's intimidating to think about, you know, that many people, uh, on the payroll, but, we're growing out of demand. Um, the construction industry is, is booming because, um, Atlanta's growing because Georgia is growing and there's not enough inventory of real estate. And so there's this huge backlog of, of new construction. Um, you know, it's six months to a year to even get a permit right now to start construction on something, whether it be a swimming pool or a, or a house. Well, I know, I don't know if you're having the same problem we're having, but as a small business, one of our biggest, if not the biggest problem is finding people that want to go to work. How about you? Is that affecting your industry as far as being able to get people in there? To, to, I mean, I've got jobs that are, I've got the need that is running terrible. We can't get anybody to actually, we can get them to come in, we can get them to talk, we can get them to interview. But when it comes time to actually go through the academy and go to work, they just kind of disappear. 
in in my world, it's a little different because um, we invest in people that have no experience. We we deliberately hire people that have no no prior experience in swimming pool construction, and we we train work them with, the right way. We train them our way, and then we we take it from there. Um, I've been talking to the folks at um, uh, in, in Gwinnett Law Enforcement uh, about the GRIP program, about the reentry program, and trying to find positions in the construction trade to help people transition um, out of jail so they have something to go into. Recidivism in Gwinnett County is the same as it is in the state, which is almost 75%. Mm-hmm. And if we can help men and women, uh, the great thing about the construction trade, it doesn't matter if you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian, it, it doesn't matter as long as you're willing to work hard. And uh, I, I believe the construction industry in particular is is a great place for, for second chances because um, you're generally not expected to, you know, to drive a company vehicle. You're not expected to um, you know, necessarily interact with the public. You're working on a crew. You're working with a team. Um, as long as you know your way around tools or you can be trained on how to work with, with certain tools, uh, it transitions very well into whether it's cleaning pools or, or something in construction. So if it's working with concrete, laying tile, um, uh, the, my construction trade in particular is, is very positive uh, towards uh, second chances with, with people. So um, if, if we can help put more Georgians back to work, uh, certainly that's been you know, a success um, story for us. But the other thing of it, too, is, is we've had to really dig deep as a company and look at the benefits we can offer to keep mm-hmm. people working. So it's not just a high wage, which I have several people uh, that, that, that make uh, uh, six figures. Uh, all my team crew leaders are all incredibly well paid. But we also give them paid time off. We also give them 401k. We offer health insurance. So um, my people are loyal to not just a paycheck, but they're loyal to a company that has taken care of them and their families too. Well, your company is run a lot like mine. From the sound of it, we're a family, and we take care of our family. We kind of we take care of those that take care of us. Absolutely. And that's kind of the way we look at it. I think we're probably a lot more like in our businesses than you think we are with even our hires because uh, same way, security doesn't matter what color, what shade, it, it makes no difference. Uh, at the same time, you know, we'd like to get people in that don't have any training necessarily because we run our own academy. That's right. And we like to train them the way we want them trained and not have to get rid of bad habits. Uh, I've given a few people second chances like you talk about. It's harder in my industry because there are so many limits through the Secretary of State's of criminal, criminal behavior and criminal records and all. But sometimes you find that nut out there that that the squirrel finds and it's just one of those people they've had a rough life they've done some things that they wish they hadn't have done and you just kind of cross your fingers and you give them that second chance and i tell you some of these people have turned out to be the best people in the world they work hard they're wanting they they're just appreciative to get that second chance so i'm i'm all with you on that part of it and grit's a great program with the county yes it is um what would you say your economic forecast is for the whole construction industry in 2022 around Georgia? We're going to see double-digit growth again this year. Um, there's been talk about a recession. I'm not seeing it. If you look at the real estate market, there's no inventory. Um, the construction trade, as long as we can um, keep getting permits, we're going to keep working. Um, it's uh, There's more work than we have ever seen, um, and we really didn't see it coming. It when, when COVID first hit, I think everyone panicked and kind of locked down for about three months. And since then, it has just been wide open. Well, they definitely panicked. Um, let's do a little bit on something else. If elected, what are your goals for your first term in office? I like that first term in office. First term. Greg Dolezal is a great senator from Forsyth County, and he gave me uh, some great advice. He said, as a legislator, what legislation you support is – just as important as what legislation you're going to oppose. And I believe that they're two sides of the same coin. So things that I will support, things that I want to do, I want to reduce taxes. I want to increase property tax exemptions. I want to strengthen our immigration policies. I want to eliminate any CRT education that's out there. I'm the most 
unwoke person <laughs> that that I know. Yeah, well, welcome to my world. <laughs> um, and so, my goals are to make sure that that this Senate district and that this state is not just the best state to do business, but but actually we can back it up and we can show measurable results by putting more money in taxpayer pockets, by helping businesses streamline their ability to get funding, to be able to get licensing, to be able to, to operate the way that they need to, and to not operate in fear of what a local county um, government may or may not do to them. Uh, the way that um, I have seen some cities within Gwinnett County tell businesses, we don't want you here anymore, mm-hmm. and we're going to pass rules and regulations that they are going to— make it hard for you to do business here. And then they push you away. Absolutely. And it has happened in Gwinnett, and it has happened to me. And so I know firsthand um, you know, what's happening there, and I know um, bureaucratically and also administratively and legislatively— what those uh, rules are, and I've I've been around long enough to know the rules of the game. So, okay, let's let's do this the right way, and let's fix this permanently, so that we're not, as business owners, subject to the whims of uh, you know who happens to get elected into to a particular uh, bureaucratic position. Well, you know, coming up with what you support is one thing, but like you said, it's just as important what you oppose. What are some of the things that you look at that you would oppose? I'm going to oppose anything to do with tax increases. I'm going to oppose anything to do with CRT. I'm going to oppose anything that creates division. Um, The Republican Party uh, has a bit of an image problem right now in that uh, people are on the left are trying to brand us as racist. And Mm -hmm. there are bad actors on both sides of that. And I've been the victim of of the bad actors on on the left, uh, just as as we have seen bad actors on the right. But what I know is that I played rugby in college. I've been punched, kicked, beat around, knocked out. I'd rather play football, thank you. (laughs) I know what it is to take a hit. I know you do. And it doesn't scare me at all to, to stand firm in the hold. I can't be pressured by media. I can't be pressured by a newspaper article or, or somebody else that's going to try to say some bad, ugly thing against me. Um, I feel like I'm pretty impenetrable when it comes to um, any issues that are out there. I don't have any skeletons. I don't have anything that I hide from or, or run from. So as a business advocate, as a, as a conservative, as a Christian, as a father, um, I believe in those principles, and I will fight like hell against anybody that, that tries to, to tear that down. Well, why should business people, business leaders, the people in general, why should they support you over anybody else that's running? So the incumbent, the current senator for Senate District 48, uh, within a week of my announcement that I was running, the incumbent Democrat announced that she would not be seeking re-election. She is the most woke. Now, that's um, power. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, she has already uh, invoked uh, saying that uh, the, the redistricting made this district unwinnable. I was planning on running against her anyway, so it's it's funny that uh, you know that it worked out this way. But uh, but she's invoked the ACLU. She's she's been on MSNBC talking about how the Georgia legislature is trying to get rid of her because of her ethnicity, and I, I think that's the funniest thing ever. So. She's invoking that. Meanwhile, she has announced that she's going to run for an open house seat, uh, House District 50, which is Johns Creek, uh, because she deems that winnable uh, for the same reason that she's accusing the Republican Party and indirectly me of targeting her because of, of her, uh, her race. So um, her, uh, her largest constituency is the Trial Lawyers Association. And um, as a business owner, I'm all about tort reform. So I will gladly say that I will be opposed to any legislation uh, that allows for these ambulance chasing trial lawyers from from targeting small business owners like myself. Uh, I will gladly take that fight all day, every day. Well, I tell you what, from a business owner, I appreciate that <laughs> yes, because it is it runs rampant. Well, if anybody wants to get on board with you or wants to help you out, maybe make donations or so forth, uh, get involved in your campaign, how would they get a hold of you and some numbers, some addresses, some emails? Thank you. Um, So my website is my name. 
uh, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, still, S-T-I-L-L.com. Um, and uh, I, there's no fancy thing to it. Uh, my cell phone number is the same cell phone number I've had for 22 years, and that number is 770-757-7038. Anybody can call me, they can text me, they can email me, sean at seanstill.com. And, uh, and I'm very proud to be able to be a candidate for this position and uh, hopefully be able to represent Gwinnett and a uh, little bit of Fulton and Forsyth too. Well, it was great finding out more about you. I did some reading on you before we came on and a lot of good stuff out there. I, you know, I tried like heck to find something bad, but I couldn't find anything bad. So that's a good thing, right? Yes, sir. Um, sean, I appreciate it. Uh, we'll have to have you come back on a little bit later and as you see how you're doing and maybe see uh, how you're doing after you've won. Thanks so much. All Appreciate right. the opportunity. Well, thank you for joining us on Case in Point, presented by Paradigm Security Services and in part by Sosby's Garage and the Manor Scholarship Fund. Be sure to join us for the live broadcast every Wednesday, other Wednesday at 11.30 a.m., here on Business Radio X. If you miss the live broadcast, no worries. You can enjoy the show anytime you want by visiting businessradiox.com, selecting the Gwinnett Studio, and then clicking on Case in Point. And for this show, all you have to do is click on uh, Sean Still. And for this program, is also available on iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, uh, just really wherever you enjoy your favorite podcast, be sure, please, to hit that subscribe button to Case in Point so you don't miss any of our future episodes. Like I say, uh, Clint Dixon's coming on next month, and it should be an interesting, interesting discussion. For my guest, Sean Still, and for my producer, Mike, I'm Rick Strawn, and remember, at Paradigm Security Services, we cover more than just your assets. <laughs>